gives us great joy to welcome officially into our community Rabbi Gluck. Took a while. Most things in synagogue life take a while. But we're so pleased to have the opportunity to formally embrace you, Shira. One benefit of waiting seven months for a formal service of welcome is that we have gotten to know Rabbi Gluck very well. She has already impacted on your lives and the life of our community. So in a sense, tonight is about affirming and celebrating our good fortune. Not really what happens in other congregations, you know, some stuffy, stiff service they strangely call an installation. It's also a high honor for us to welcome Rabbi Gluck's parents, her mother, Sarah, a deeply respected master educator and role model for so many reformed Jewish educators, and her father, Rabbi Arnie Gluck, one of our movement's most internationally recognized and influential spiritual leaders, and my colleague and friend now for three decades. And so you see that Rabbi Gluck comes to us having already been ferociously trained at home by the best that the Jewish community produces. How fortunate for us. Sarah and Arnie, we welcome you with open arms and hope to see you often in the years to come. Upon completion of Rabbi Gluck's Bar Torah, her parents will come up to the Bima and bless her. Shira, you stand in a long line of distinguished assistant rabbis at Stephen Wise. Your arrival comes at a point of tremendous growth for this historic congregation. Families, children, singles, couples, empty nesters from all boroughs of New York City and some from outside of New York City are surging into this congregation. Many hundreds of people check it, us in Shabbat and are part of us here virtually every week. In all of our 113 year history, the Free Synagogue and later the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue has never been as popular as it is now. We have an opportunity together, you and our highly talented professional team, our dedicated clergy, our educators and Jewish professionals, along with our remarkable lay leadership and congregants, we have an opportunity to make history together. It's what this congregation is about, making history. That is the fundamental legacy bequeathed to us by Rabbi Wise himself. Shira, may these years that you spend in our midst be good years for you. May these be years of growth, vitality, friendship, and great satisfaction. There is no more rewarding or privileged endeavor in the world than to be rabbi to the congregation. So Rabbi Gluck, Shira, come share with us some words of Torah. How many of you have a favorite movie that you know so well you can recite every line along with the characters. Mm -hmm. Our parasha this week is Bo, and it opens with one of the most quotable lines in the entire Torah. I'm guessing you all know it. Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh carrying a message from God saying, we can do better than that. Yes, that's it. But would it surprise you to hear that this quote is not entirely accurate? Or rather, it is incomplete. Here is the full message that Moses and Aaron deliver to Pharaoh. Shalach ami v'ya'avduni. Let my people go that they may worship me. This is not the first time that God sends this message to Pharaoh. In last week's parsha, it has already happened six times. 
God says, let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness. Pharaoh says, no. And the Nile turns to blood. Seven days and ten verses later, Pharaoh again refuses and Egypt is plagued with frogs. When this becomes unbearable, Pharaoh brings Moses and Aaron to him, begging for the plague to end, promising, I will let the people go to sacrifice to Adonai. This back and forth of promises made and broken continues again, lice, and again, hellish swarms of insects, and again, and again, and again. Egypt is stricken with diseased animals, suffocating darkness, and fiery hail. In this week's story, God threatens Pharaoh once again, and his advisors beg him to relent. So Pharaoh asks, Mi umi haholchim, who will go? Moses answers, Our youth and our elderly will go. Our sons and our daughters will go. Our flocks and our herds will go. Ki chag l'adonai lanu. For it is a festival of Adonai to us. At first glance, this may seem odd. The children and the elderly will go? What about the vast swath of Israelites who are neither the oldest nor the youngest? In the language of the Torah, this means every Israelite, the youngest and the oldest, and everyone in between. Those who are dependent and independent, any gender, every status. When Pharaoh tells Moses and Aaron, no, only the two of them may go to worship Adonai, without the rest of the Israelites, they refuse. At a moment declared Chag Ladonai, a celebration of the eternal God, it is not enough that only the leaders should be present. No, Israel is meant to worship as one, all of us together. Up until this point, the Israelites are a loose affiliation of tribes, connected only by common ancestry and shared suffering. But in this moment, when they are called upon to worship together and rejoice in this Chag of the Eternal, the Israelites are transformed into a people. It is not for fear and uncertainty that the Israelites come together. It is for celebration. We excel at coming together in grief and solidarity. But the parasha teaches us that we must also come together for Chag, for rejoicing in our Judaism, not just fearing for it. Times of communal celebration also serve as affirmations of covenant, of the sacred bonds of community. This Shabbat is not a celebration of me as an individual, but of the sacred relationship between rabbi and congregation. This is a celebration of us, a time for us to establish and affirm, together, our covenant. And just like the Israelites assembled in the wilderness, everyone's presence is necessary for the affirmation of covenant. Every one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, has a unique role to play, and we do so together. The Kabbalistic text, Megaleh Amukot, teaches that the number of Israelites present in the wilderness was equal to the number of letters in the Torah. Just as the absence of one letter renders a Torah scroll unfit for use, the loss of even one person prevents us from fulfilling our divine mission. Building on this, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs writes, when letters are joined to others, they make a word. Words combined with sentences, sentences connect to make a paragraph, and paragraphs join to make a story. Every Jew is a letter, 
Each Jewish family is a word, every community a sentence, and the Jewish people at any one time is a paragraph. The Jewish people through time constitutes a story. When even one letter is missing, our words and sentences lack meaning, and our people's story is incomplete. So too, without any one of you, our community and the Jewish people are incomplete. When I was training as a soferet, a scribe of sacred writings, I studied a variety of texts about Hebrew letters and their meaning. One of my favorites is a teaching from the Zohar, and it says, Kol echad mi Yisrael, yesh lo dvekut leot echad me haTorah. Every single Jew has dvekut, a deep spiritual connection to one letter of the Torah. The Torah contains 304,805 letters. 304,805 pieces of the Jewish story. 304,805 ways to be Jewish. Jewish with text, Jewish with language, with history, with food, music, art, philosophy, activism. The opportunities are boundless. Which letter of Torah is yours? What is your individual approach, your unique way of connecting to and expressing your Judaism? If you know, how can I help you pursue it? If you don't know, how can I help you find it? This is the covenant that I, as your rabbi, make with each of you to accompany you on your journey, to be with you in moments of fear and uncertainty and in moments of celebration and joy, to accompany you, to walk beside you as you claim your letter of the Torah. Moses and Aaron teach us that Jewish life isn't possible unless it includes us all every member of the community, and may we go together from strength to strength. Precious Shira, Rabbi Shira, you are Rabbah, multifaceted and blessed with many gifts. <clears throat> Shira, you who are so ferret, one who writes Sifrei Torah Umigilot, you are like the Kulmus, the quill, a vehicle for writing the next chapter in our people's sacred history and sacred story helping them to write themselves into that story. And so we bless you as the Talmud teaches. May you always be soft as a reed and never unyielding as a cedar, strong but not rigid, flexible yet principled, blessed to be a blessing to all as you learn and teach, grow and guide. Our pride in you is beyond words. Love you with all our hearts. May God be with you and bless you in all things, and may you continue to go from strength to strength, finding joy and abundance in everything you do. Amen.